Hello, and welcome back to the Bill of Rights Institute's Close Reads. Today, I'm going to be taking a look at Federalist 51, and we're going to see if we can get it explained for you. Federalist 51 comes right at the center of the Federalist Papers, or pretty close to it. Uh, there were 85 papers um, written between 1787 and 1788. Um, and Federalist 51 is one of those famous ones that we've all heard of, uh, and maybe you're here because you're talking about it in class. So without further ado, let's take a look. So our central question in looking at this text today is how does this structure of our federal system protect liberty? And really what we're looking at is how is it that Publius argues that the federal system is going to protect liberty? Uh, just by way of some context, again, uh, these Federalist Papers were all written um, between 1787 and um, 1788 during what's called the ratification debates. So in order for the Constitution to become legal after the Philadelphia Convention, there was it was necessary that nine out of the 13 states ratified the new constitution. And by ratified, I mean assented to it, said, hey, this looks great. Uh, so in pursuit of that, uh, these essays were written by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay uh, to argue in favor of the new constitution, basically to lay out why it was designed the way it was designed, what it was their intention was going to do. And then towards the end, they begin arguing uh, with others who were writing against them, um, who were labeled anti-federalists, but were really just a collection of different individuals who were uh, concerned about the new growing central government. And, and in it, they lay out across 85 papers, this really strong argument. Um, the whole book itself is really interesting and tightly constructed. There's sort of a flow and rhythm to it and going in order uh, can help you better understand it. Uh, but we tend to pick out a couple of these favorites. I think 10 and 51 are probably the ones that you've most read, uh, but one is really interesting, 84 is really interesting, uh, 72, uh, 62, there's 74, there's a whole bunch I can go into it. But today we're going to look at 51, and 51 really is central uh, to what's going on. So it was published in February of 1788, uh, and already um, I think six states had already ratified the Constitution at this point, so they needed three more to get to the nine. Um, but really, these were being written in New York and were intended for a New York audience because New York was one of the biggest states at the time. And New York and Virginia were really the two states that the Federalists really wanted to ratify the Constitution in order for it to become uh, really understood to be law. So it was legal at nine, uh, but everybody kind of understood that if New York and Virginia didn't sign on board, the two biggest states in the nation at that point, uh, then we really wouldn't get, uh, get it would, really wouldn't be accepted uh, in a way that, that would stand. So in Federalist 51, Publius, which is the pen name for Madison, Jay, and Hamilton, um, is taking on this big question. And this comes sort of right in the middle of where they're about to transition and talking about the legislature. Um, and he lays out, um, he says this right at the beginning. He says, the structure of the government must furnish the proper checks and balances between the different departments. All right, well, let's unpack that a little bit. What, what are we actually talking about here? We're talking about checks and balances, right? Something we're probably all familiar with. And the question is, how does the Constitution maintain this idea of checks and balances? He actually opens the paper itself with this question. It says, to what expedient then shall we finally resort for maintaining in practice the necessary partition of power among the several departments as laid down in the Constitution? In other words, what confidence do we have that once we put this Constitution in place, it's going to maintain itself? How, how, how is it that we know that the legislature isn't going to become dominant? How is it that we know that the executive power isn't just going to trounce everything else? And uh, the question on the minds of many of the anti-federalists, how do we know that the central government isn't going to come to dominate everything else in the country? So going forward, um, he wants to start out his argument by pointing out why this is an important thing, right? So the separation of powers, what is significant about it? He says, in order to lay a due foundation for the separate and distinct exercise of different powers of government, which to a certain extent is admitted on all hands to be essential to the preservation of liberty, it is evident that each department should have a will of its own and consequently should be so constituted that the members of each should have as little agency as possible in the appointment of the others, of the members of the others. All right, it's a mouthful. But what he's really saying here is we all agree that the separation of powers is key to the preservation of liberty. So again, thinking back to our central question, how does the government structure preserve liberty? Well, here Publius is arguing the separation of powers is something that is essential to that preservation. And so in order to have that separation of powers in the way that it was designed in the Constitution, we need certain mechanisms that are going to allow for that to happen. And here Publius is saying that a great way to keep those separation of powers intact is to give each 
department its own agency. In other words, its own ability to act of its own accord. And within that, that means not appointing the members of others. So the uh, House of Representatives doesn't get to choose who is in the Senate. The Senate doesn't get to choose who is president um, and so on and so forth. This though is the perfect practicable way of thinking about it, right? If Publius goes on, and I only have segments of the paper here, so we're not gonna go into every nuance, but he goes on to say, look, this is great in theory, uh, but in practice, there are certain exceptions that we have to make to this. He points out the judicial branch, for example. We don't necessarily want the judicial branch to be elected by the people. Why? Uh, because it would make them too dependent upon them when they're rendering decisions that ought to be just based in the law, right? So he makes a practical accommodation. He does this with a few other branches too. So he says, this is sort of the theoretical ideal that we're going for. There's this perfect independence and we're keeping everything apart, but we know in practice, it's gonna be a little bit different. And he says, he goes on to say this, and this is probably one of the most famous lines in this paper. He says, but the great security gets a gradual concentration of the several powers in the same department consists in giving to those who administer each department the necessary constitutional means and personal motivations to resist encroachments of, of the others. In other words, um, there's a couple of things that are interesting in that first line to me. First, gradual concentration of the center of the several powers, right? So it, it's not as though it's going to be immediate. And I think this is something that some of the um, uh, those who were opposed to the new constitution were, were concerned about, that even though we come out with this great idea, over time, this is going to get eroded. And so that idea of, of sort of a gradual concentration um, or, or drifting, uh, as, as other intellectuals have, have noted it, um, was really in the forefront. And he says that in order to avoid that sort of gradual concentration, uh, you need to give to each of those who are in the different departments the necessary constitutional means, so that the authority, the power, and the personal motivation. So here he's saying it doesn't, it's not enough just to give them the power to protect their own interests, but they have to personally be vested in what's going on. So this is the first kind of tip towards human nature. Uh, which we're going to talk about again here in just a second, but but this idea that it's not just about how it is that we can create a governmental system that's going to protect this, but we also have to keep in mind the people who are populating that thing. We have to give them a personal interest in keeping that separated and, and in protecting the powers of the branch they've been elected to. So it goes on to say this, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. The interest of the man must be connected with the constitutional rights of the place. It may be a reflection on human nature that such devices should be necessary to control the abuses of government. But what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. So this beautiful phrasing uh, that Publius uh, writes here, um, and in this case, Publius is James Madison. Um, but th the way that he constructs this is to say, look, we have to uh, in, we have to understand that people are ambitious, or that ambition will be a part of what people are trying to accomplish, and that ambition is what drives the overreach of power. So that overreach of power, right, stepping outside of your design uh, role needs to be put in conflict with other people who are doing it so that the tension between those things counteracts. So he says the interest must be connected with the constitutional rights of the place. So the personal actions of that individual politician must be connected to his own role so that he has an interest in maintaining sort of his position. He says it may be a reflection on human nature that such devices should be necessary to control the abuses of government. In other words, Look, we're not designing this for the ideal person. We're not designing this for, say, the George Washington, who is the, you know, in the eyes of many of the founders, this perfect epitome of, of, of courage and of civic virtue. But we're instead designing it for the everyday person, which we all know um, at times will overreach and at times will fall short of their goals. At times they will be imperfect. And so, because that is that that is uh, mass, and they're reflecting on human nature, meaning it, we know this is going to happen. And he says that he takes a step back. Says, but what is government? But the greatest reflections on all human nature. Of course, we need this. It's not bad that we're taking into account that there's not going to be perfect um, individuals occupying these offices. It's us understanding that and designing a government around that understanding of human nature. If men were angels, in other words, if men were perfect, 
we would need government. We would all exist happily together. We would pursue justice and protect our liberties and everything would be perfect, but we're not. And so because we're not, we need uh, both these external um, and internal controls on government, meaning the external being, for example, the, the popular will of the people, ensuring that government is maintaining itself. And then of course, internal, uh, meaning these different checks and balances that are keeping together uh, uh, this, this system of government so that it stays on track. So Publius goes on to, to talk about um, uh, in framing this government. He says, um, so, th so this is all great. We're now gonna be framing the government um, he says, in framing the government, which is to be administered by men over men, the greatest difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. A dependence on the people is no doubt the primary control on the government, but experience has taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions. So here again, he is talking about this external dependence on the people, and it's that external dependence that is going to keep government controlled uh, but we also need these auxiliary precautions, these internal controls, in order to uh, maintain uh, the government moving in the direction that it's going to be. Because again, we've just reflected on human nature, we've acknowledged that man is not perfect. And so when he's saying in framing government, which is to be administered by men over men, here he's directly appealing to the argument he just made. Look, we know people aren't perfect, and those imperfect people are going to be ruling over other imperfect people. Ultimately, the people need to be the control and we need to rely on them and trust in them because that is the foundation of Republican government that people can be trusted to govern themselves. But uh, even though we will be trusting them, uh, we also need these auxiliary precautions in order to maintain it. So that's the beginning of Federalist 51. Uh, we're, we will be back next week uh, to talk about the next section of Federalist 51, where Publius takes a little bit of a turn and starts talking about not only the internal controls of the Constitution and how it's constructed, uh, but also how the federal system, meaning the relationship between the states and the federal central government itself, uh, helps to maintain this balance and, and also acts as another control helping to maintain these governments. I hope you'll join me again then.